Alo? Kiến nhà má This is Steve Zeltzer with Workweek. And today we're going to be covering the struggle in Puerto Rico. There's been hurricanes. There have been uh, catastrophes as far as electrical power. And uh, there is now a major struggle against privatization of uh, their electric uh, uh, power facility. And joining us today is Senator Rafael Bernabe. He's a senator in Puerto Rico and is also a professor at the University of Puerto Rico and also uh, Ricardo Ortiz, who's a labor researcher and activist. Welcome to our show. Good evening. Good. So talking about Puerto Rico, I mean, Puerto Rico was invaded in 1898 by the United States, supposedly to bring democracy. Uh, That's what they said. They're going to help the Puerto Ricans. There's been a long struggle for independence in Puerto Rico. And uh, not only has the United States been involved in intervening in Puerto Rican affairs, but the uh, the unions in the United States have been involved in Puerto Rico as well. Uh, the history of Puerto Rico is a, a history connected to the United States and U.S. policies. Maybe, Rafael, you can talk about that history, the relevance of that uh, to today's struggle. It's a long and complex history. It's a long background. Puerto Rico, uh, I guess I should say, you know, for people who are not familiar with the situation of Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico has been a colony of the United States since uh, 1898. Puerto Rico was taken over by the United States as a result of the Spanish-American War, during which the United States also occupied Cuba and the Philippines. And uh, Cuba became independent a little bit later, 1903. The Philippines remained a colony of the U.S. until just after the Second World War. And Puerto Rico is still a colony of the United States. Um, As some of you may know, for example, uh, federal legislation, all the legislation approved by the US Congress applies to Puerto Rico. And so do all the fundamental decisions taken by the president of the United States and by the federal agencies and so on. And uh, one of the consequences of this colonial relationship uh, is the fact that most of Puerto Rico's economy, the main uh, industrial and productive uh, sectors of Puerto Rico's economy are controlled by U.S. corporations, U.S. multinationals. That has been the case uh, over the 20th century and is still the case today. Of course, in different epochs, there have been different uh, areas of the economy in which the the U.S. corporations have uh, have, uh, invested. Uh, There was an epoch in which the major industry in Puerto Rico was the sugar industry in the beginning of the 20th century, and it was controlled by U.S. corporations. Then after that, after the Second World War, there was a period in which uh, many economists call it the epoch of light manufacturing, which there were many manufacturing enterprises, uh, again, most of them owned by U.S. companies. And after the 1970s, we have an epoch in which we have a a high-tech enterprises operating in Puerto Rico. The most important ones are the pharmaceutical companies, which operate in Puerto Rico, generate not that much employment, but they generate a lot of profits. And uh, all through that period, all through the 20th century and up to the present, this uh, colonial economy controlled by U.S. corporations has never been able to generate uh, sufficient employment by any means for Puerto Rico's labor force. So uh, Puerto Rico has always had, and today still has, a very, very high unemployment rate uh, and a very low uh, uh, labor participation rate. That is, most people in Puerto Rico uh, cannot find uh, gainful employment. Uh, That also explains why so many people in Puerto Rico migrate to the United States, because they they can't find uh, jobs in Puerto Rico and they have to try and make a living elsewhere, and they do so by migrating to the United States. So it's it's not a surprise that uh, the other side of the colonial economy that we've had uh, for so many decades is the fact that there are so many, many Puerto Ricans uh, who live outside Puerto Rico because they cannot make a living in Puerto Rico. Now, that's kind of the general framework uh, that situation, which uh, under normal circumstances is, is a very uh, difficult situation for the Puerto Rican people, became even graver uh, beginning around 2000, uh, 
2005, the last 15 years, the last 16 years of Puerto Rico's history has been a period of uh, economic uh, depression. The economy of Puerto Rico hasn't grown basically over these uh, 15 years. Uh, around 20% uh, of the jobs that existed 15 years ago do not exist anymore. So you had a very big drop in uh, employment in Puerto Rico. And uh, on top of that, we've had, you know, all the natural or, you know, semi-natural disasters that we've suffered, you know, like, like Hurricane Maria in 2017. So that the, uh, the Puerto Rican situation, which has never been good, <laughs> has become much worse during the last, uh, last 15 years. Now, the other element that I should add in this general framework is that um, as the economy of Puerto Rico stagnated and as the revenues of the government of Puerto Rico stagnated as well or fell, the government of Puerto Rico uh, tried to um, resolve this situation by borrowing an increasing amount of money. So at the same time, the economy of Puerto Rico went into a crisis uh, 15 years ago, government borrowing went up very rapidly, up to the point that by 2015, the government of Puerto Rico was unable to service the debt. So Puerto Rico went on, on the, into default. And at that moment, the US Congress approved a, an important piece of legislation, which is known as PROMESA, that's the acronym for the, for the measure, the Puerto Rico Oversight and Management uh, Economic Management Act or something like that. It's the PROMESA Act. And PROMESA created a board, a federal, federally appointed board. It's called the, uh, officially it's called the Federal Oversight and Management Board. In Puerto Rico, we call it La Junta, the board. And La Junta, the board, is in charge of, uh, has been in charge since it was created, of managing, basically managing Puerto Rico's budgets. Uh, the government of Puerto Rico had limited power uh, before, and now it has even more limited power because what it does is very much controlled and supervised by the, La Junta. And La Junta, of course, has been uh, imposing uh, terrible austerity measures, uh, budget cuts in the University of Puerto Rico, in many government agencies, uh, freezing uh, government employment, uh, increasing the cost of many public services and so on. All of this with the objective of generating uh, enough income or reducing government uh, spending so that uh, Puerto Rico's uh, creditors can be paid. So you have the Junta. The Junta has been renegotiating Puerto Rico's debt. And uh, right now we're in the middle of that fight because right now, uh, the, the Junta, the board, has come to an agreement with Puerto Rico's uh, creditors, with the bondholders. It is an agreement that most of us, and many people in Puerto Rico, think is very unfavorable to Puerto Rico, that it should be rejected, because accepting it would leave Puerto Rico with debt payments, which would force the government to uh, carry out even more austerity measures. So one of the big uh, struggles that has been going on in Puerto Rico in the last few weeks is precisely against that uh, agreement with the uh, with the bondholders that uh, accord with the bondholders, uh, and as you mentioned, as in many other countries during the last two decades, and we're still in that fight. The government of Puerto Rico, before and along with the junta after 2017, has been carrying out what in Latin America we call neoliberal policies, privatization policies, which have included privatizing the health system, privatizing part of the school system, and uh, privatizing the, as you mentioned, the energy sector. The, right now we are in the process of uh, privatization of the uh, transmission and distribution uh, service of the electrical system. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the general framework you know, that, uh, we, of course, we could, you know, we could speak about this for three hours, but the general framework, we have a colonial relationship, political colonial relationship, and we have a colonial economy with all the drawbacks of such uh, an arrangement. Um, very high unemployment, as I said, many people have to move out of Puerto Rico. Uh, and, um, and that colonial economy, which has always had this, uh, this, um, problems that I mentioned, uh, 
structural problems has gone itself into crisis during the last uh, 15 years. So Puerto Rico has lived, uh, the, the only thing that you could compare what Puerto Rico has gone through in the last decade is the Great Depression of the 1930s. You know, we are going through our second Great uh, uh, Depression. Uh, so it's a very difficult situation. The positive side, I guess we'll talk about it a little bit later, is that uh, none of this has gone without resistance. That is, uh, uh, labor, the labor movement, community groups, women, and so on and so forth have mobilized uh, to try and resist some of the consequences of, uh, of these policies that we have been. Uh, okay, we're speaking with Rafael Bernabe. He's a senator and University of Puerto Rico professor. And the structural adjustment, I know the free, first free trade zone was set up in Puerto Rico in a film called Bootstrap about how they were going to make uh, Puerto Rico more efficient and uh, a, a better economy. That didn't work. And th when you talk about privatization, maybe we can discuss privatization and also the role of the AFL-CIO in, say, healthcare in Puerto Rico. You used to have a national public health care system in Puerto Rico. What, what happened to that? And what role did the Democrats play who have been uh, in control of Puerto Rico part of the time? First of all, the privatization policies. Uh, as a result of uh, reforms that were carried out in the 1940s in Puerto Rico, mo some of them in the context of the, of the New Deal, like in the U.S., there was, uh, there used to be a large public sector in Puerto Rico. The energy system was government owned, the water system is government owned. And there was, as you said, of course, we have a public school system. And uh, there was a, um, um, at, at one point, there was a uh, phone company, which was also government owned, and uh, a shipping system, which was owned by the government as well. And we had a health system. The case of the health system is probably the most uh, tragic one because the health system in Puerto Rico, the public health system in Puerto Rico was a system which was uh, quite uh, ably uh, constructed and, and well, uh, what should I say, uh, designed. Uh, uh, it was a structure which uh, for many other countries was kind of a model that people came to study because it was, it was uh, a very uh, interesting uh, scheme. And uh, it basically had clinics all over the island, and uh, then you have secondary and tertiary and, and all sorts of, uh, it was sort of a pyramid um, of uh, services that were provided, and that um, it was supposed to be able to adapt to the particular needs of different communities. That is, for example, Puerto Rico, even though Puerto Rico is relatively small, it has a very varied uh, geography. You have people who live on the sea level, you know, and it's certain uh, situation and you have people who live in the mountains you know and the health needs of these communities are not necessarily the same and so on so so you have this public uh, health system which was very well designed very well uh, structured and of course there were problems with it there were there were there was lack of equipment there was it was not perfect but what should have been done is to perfect to to develop to to better uh, equip this system in the 1990s, the, the notion uh, adopted by the government was that the solution to the problems that the system had was privatizing this system. So what they did was they, um, and of course, I, I should have said, you know, this, this public um, uh, health system was free. I mean, people get sick, they go, they go to the hospital. And of course, there were some private hospitals as well. You know, people who had money could go to the private hospitals, but everybody could go to the public hospitals. Now. Uh, in the 1990s, the government of Puerto Rico decided that the solution to the problems of, this, of that system was to privatize it. So what they did is that they sold to private uh, uh, persons or companies uh, most of the clinics, most of the facilities, many of the hospitals, not all of them, but many, many hospitals and so on, which would then operate and now operate on a profit basis. You know, that is, they, are, they become uh, private businesses. And at the same time, they created, which was, I guess, the least bad aspect of all of this, for, for the many people who would not be able to pay for, you know, for the private hospitals and, and, who, and who do not have uh, uh, health insurance through their jobs and so on, uh, 
uh, they created a public uh, a, a public uh, insurance so that people would you know everybody would have some sort of insurance so they could they could go to these private hospitals. Now what that has meant was that we we have a very instead of having a system a health system what we have is a collection of installations you know built and constructed in an anarchic way uh, wherever you know and whenever some private investor decides to build a clinic, a hospital, or a laboratory. None of this is planned anymore. So it's a very incoherent system uh, in which uh, you have providers located in certain metropolitan areas, but there are whole communities that don't have any providers, and therefore people have to travel long distances to, to go to the hospital, or go to the dentist, or go to whatever. And, um, and furthermore, you have a system in which the private insurance companies basically control everything. They control uh, a, which doctors are part of their, their, their insurance systems. They control the fees, basically, that, that doctors and providers uh, have to charge. And many times they control even what people have access to. For example, it's very common, happens to me all the time, that you go to a pharmacy or you go to a doctor even, and the doctor wants to prescribe, you know, something to you. But before prescribing that to you, we have to find out if that which they want to prescribe for health reasons is covered by my insurance. So it turns out that who, the person who decides, you know, whether I get a prescription or, or not, is not the doctor, it's, you know, the who, uh, whichever official in the insurance company is looking into my plan to see if I can, I recently, you know, they prescribed something for me recently and I used up the, the dose that they gave me. And so I went for another dose and they told me, well, we have to find out if your insurance covers another dose because it turns out that you can have another dose, but you have to wait like three months before you get a second dose of this thing. So it's not the doctor who decides whether I should get another dose, but rather it's the, the uh, insurance company. So, um, so by now, just about everybody in Puerto Rico agrees that the result of privatization of the of the health system uh, that we had uh, has been uh, terrible. You know, the, the consequences have been have been horrible, and that uh, and that we have to somehow uh, start rebuilding the public system that we used to have. It's not going to be easy, but we have to move in that in that direction. Uh, we also had experiments, for example, of privatizing the uh, water system, the, the what we call the aqueductos, the water system, water service in Puerto Rico. And that case was e even more uh, interesting, I guess, because they privatized it and uh, the privatizing company, the, the company that took over the system was so bad that they, after two or three years, they had to take it back. You know, government had to, to take it back and begin operating it again as a public utility. And they did it again. Like two years after that, they privatized the administration of the system again with another different uh, private corporation. And again, it was so bad that after two or three years, they had to take it back. And, and right now the water system is, is publicly owned and publicly operated after they twice tried to privatize it and twice the, the, the operation did not, did not work. Um, so, um, so yes, you know, we had these experiments with privatization. Right now we are going to another uh, wave of privatization. In this case, it's the um, electrical power system, uh, which they have split into different areas. This normally, historically, it has functioned as, as one system. You have generation of electricity and you have the, 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 the transmission and the distribution of, of electricity and you have the, uh, all the administrative um, process, you know, client uh, services to the clients and, and so on and so forth. So they have split the, the operation into several areas, generation, transmission and distribution, uh, uh, client services and so on. And they have um, privatized, they have uh, uh, signed the contract with a private corporation uh, that has taken over the transmission and distribution of energy, not generation yet. They they want to they want to privatize generation as well, uh, 
But uh, right now, what we have is the privatization of the transmission and distribution system. Uh, you know, electricity that comes out of the generating plants until they get to your home. And uh, so we have this corporation, it's called Luma, and uh, it has taken over. Uh, the government is paying it around the hundred uh, million dollars a year for it to operate uh, the, the system. Uh, and uh, so far, you know, the results have also been very negative, uh, most people would say, you know, the... Um, the uh, frequency of uh, how you call it, apagones, uh, blackouts or, or, or outages, the frequency of, of, of outages and, uh, and the uh, length of the outages and so on has increased over the last few months after the company took over. So there's a lot of discontent with, uh, with this process of privatization, which I should, I, should, I should take the opportunity of saying that if for some reason I... <laughs> I disconnect all of a sudden. It's precisely because I lost power, which would not be would not be strange because it happens. It happens quite often. I've I've been in other interviews and all of a sudden poof, it goes and and uh, so we you, we may get a, a practical example of, of what I'm talking about. And of course, it's not unique to Puerto Rico. Uh, Louisiana, uh, New Orleans privatized their electric system and have had outages uh, mm -hmm. after their hurricanes. Uh, they were promised that they would be able to maintain the electricity. It didn't work out. And as a, as a result of that, uh, they had a lot of people die because of the lack of air conditioning and, and health conditions. And this privatization, the fight against privatization, I know in the United States, uh, health care is privatized. And there has been, even in the midst of a pandemic, no national health care. You still have private companies, dr private drug companies in charge of health care. Um, this fight against privatization, what role did the, Ricardo, the AFL-CIO or the SEIU play in the privatization of the healthcare system in Puerto Rico? Very uh, negative one. Actually, uh, in uh, the summer of 1998, uh, the former national president of uh, SEIU, Andy Stern, he flew to Puerto Rico and he uh, participated in a press conference with then uh, Governor Pedro Rosselló, and he said that he supported, you know, uh, the so-called healthcare reform. Uh, so obviously, it was not a, a very good role that, uh, you know, the full CIO played. You know, Stern uh, uh, said those uh, things, and, uh, you know, the president uh, of the FLCIO group in Puerto Rico, uh, a man called uh, Jose uh, Rodriguez Baez, you know, he stood silent, obviously, uh, because, uh, you know, he didn't oppose it. Uh, so uh, definitely uh, the FEL CIO did not uh, oppose, uh, didn't uh, waive a campaign to stop the privatization. But I want to add a couple of things about this issue. Uh, in 1992, uh, it was selected in Puerto Rico a, a medical doctor called Pedro Rosselló, who actually, he said that uh, the book that he has uh, had read at that time and uh, fascinated him was a book called The Reinvention of Government, which uh, is written by David uh, Osborne, where in that uh, book, uh, it, uh, it promotes the idea that government uh, should be uh, only uh, executing security duties for the population and not intervening, and government should refrain to intervene in the economy. So, uh, and, you know, and actually this uh, a man called uh, Pedro Rosselló, he was a member and still is of the Democratic Party. Also, uh, he promised some deals that uh, so-called, you know, trade union leaders uh, supported. Uh, he, uh, 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 supposedly was going to support uh, to uh, support legislation that would allow uh, a, a workers in government agencies, not in public corporations, but uh, in agencies, to have the right to organize and you know uh, trade unions and collect uh, and have collective rights, uh, collective bargaining rights. But at the same time, uh, the unions in these sectors would surrender the right to strike. 
What was happening uh, before uh, Pedro Rosselló came into power was that uh, assisted these, uh, you know, labor organizations called uh, organiz uh, organizaciones bona fide. You know, they were not uh, trade unions in the strict sense, but they have a, a, a collective bargaining power. And uh, although they uh, in within the law didn't have the right to strike, also there was no prohibition to strike, okay? So with this legislation, it was called, uh, uh, finally when it was approved, was a uh, law uh, 45 for, I think it was uh, 94 or something like that. Uh, it, it prohibited the ability of these organizations to uh, uh, explicitly to go on strike and also would impose severe fines if these organizations uh, would uh, uh, exercise uh, that, those actions. Uh, the FLCIO group in Puerto Rico supported that legislation because they saw uh, as an opportunity to bargain and organize, but at the same time, you know, uh, they gave up, you know, the right to uh, strike. So that was a complete, uh, you know, sellout. I mean, uh, if you have, a, like, you know, it's a common sense in the labor movement, organized labor with uh, bargaining rights, and uh, you have a, a labor organization in the healthcare system, and, uh, you know, uh, the, the employer in this case, you know, is the government, comes with a plan to privatize the system, what should the trade unions uh, do in that, in that situation? They should oppose, they should have strike, they should have done, you know, actions to uh, stop the government from doing that. You know, that effectively, unfortunately, was not the case. And the other issue, uh, I mean, around privatization is charter schools. The last time I was in Puerto Rico, there was a protest by the teachers union uh, against a raid uh, uh, by a union supported by the AFT um, uh, for uh, charter schools. They were fighting charter schools in education. Uh, and the, the, again, American unions were involved in, in uh, basically supporting those policies. Uh, Rafael, what has been the uh, role in the fight against privatization in education, University of Puerto Rico and in public education? There has been, uh, over the years, over, you know, ever, ever since the 1990s, the epoch of Pedro Rosselló, when Pedro Rosselló was governor, which was really the beginning of the very strong privatization offensive in Puerto Rico, there have been several attempts and several uh, uh, ways in which uh, the governments have tried to privatize the public school system. And fortunately, they have not succeeded. You know, they, they have made some inroads, but they have basically not succeeded so far, which is, you know, it's a good thing. So uh, at one point we had the, what we call, I think you have this in the US as well, this notion of the voucher program, which is that the government, the government would uh, take money out of the public school system uh, and, and use it to give uh, families or, or parents these vouchers, this money, so they could pay for private schools. So, so you have, uh, it's not actually, you know, privatizing the schools, so it's basically the same thing. You, you, uh, reduce the budget of the public school system and you pass the money that you are taking out of the public school system to private schools. So that was one of, way, one, one of the ways of trying to, to privatize the, the school system, reducing the public school system and creating this, uh, this uh, voucher program so that people would pay for the private schools. Well, that didn't... Uh, pan out uh, and there was a lot of opposition. There was a lot of mobilization against it. Uh, and and one of the things that they were trying to do at the time was to take out money from the budget of the University of Puerto Rico, where I work, in order to pay for part of this voucher program. So the struggle against that uh, also mobilized uh, the students and professors in the university because we were against uh, the voucher program to begin with. But even more so, if it meant reducing the budget of the university to pay for this voucher program. So fortunately, between the mobilizations with the teachers and the students and the university and so on, this program basically was never was never uh, really carried out. Uh, fortunately, then we've had several different versions of the 
basic idea of the charter schools, which is, you know, as I said, is they've come up with different schemes, but it's basically the same idea, which is to um, uh, allow private uh, uh, concerns by private uh, companies uh, to <coughs> take over specific schools or several schools and uh, administer them. You know, and they, they would take they would manage these schools as uh, as private entities uh, under different arrangements that they have proposed with the government. Some cases the government pays them to do this. In some cases they uh, invest money in the schools and they the government pays them part of what they spend and so on. So there are di different schemes, but the basic idea is that we turn over the private uh, the public schools to private enterprises who are then are going to manage these the schools. And again, uh, they had, they've had some success in that there are some, they have been able to, to uh, uh, establish some of these charter schools. You know, somebody wants, to, somebody wants to create one of these charter schools, they have to apply, they have to present you know, their, 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 their proposal and demonstrate that they have the resources to do this and, they, and it has to be approved and so on. And every time one of these things uh, comes up, but there's opposition, there's mobilizations, and so on. So they have been able to create some charter schools, but uh, they are not that many. You know, the fact is that uh, the basically the schools, the public school system is still the public school system, and the resistance has been relatively successful. The tragedy of the school system at this stage has not been the fact that it has been privatized, but perhaps it, it's even worse. I don't know. Uh, is is that the, the tragedy lies in the fact that it has been destroyed. That is to say, in the last uh, five or six years, we've had uh, around 400 schools in Puerto Rico that have been closed. Uh, there used to be around uh, 1,200 schools in Puerto Rico, 1,200 1, schools in Puerto Rico. And nowadays, there's probably around, I think, 700 schools left. And you know, so there's a huge amount of schools that have been closed. Uh, many of these schools were a, a schools in Puerto Rico, I guess in the U.S. as well. But in Puerto Rico, you have we have 78 municipalities. Puerto Rico is divided into 78 municipalities, and each one of these municipalities is is in turn divided into what we call barrios or neighborhoods. Uh, so each municipality has you know 10 15, five, depending on the size of the municipality, barrios. Probably in each barrio of Puerto Rico, there's at least, or historically, there was at least one school. In some barrios which are big, there may be more than one public school. And these schools were very important and are very important to the life of these barrios. You know, sometimes they are part of the history of the barrio. You know, they are meeting places. They are places where all the children uh, meet, you know, and, and, and build the community from, from their early years and so on. And so the closing of these, of these schools, in many cases, you know, it's not simply, uh, you know, uh, an administrative action, you know, that you eliminate the school and you move the children to another place. It really disrupts uh, the whole life of the community, the whole routine of the community, the whole tradition of the community, and so on. So the closing of these uh, 400 schools has been a very traumatic experience for for many many people, many many students, many teachers, many communities, and so on. And it's it's a very really it's a very very depressing sight when you travel around Puerto Rico and you see a uh, very easy very it's very visible. You see school after school after school, which used to be you know full of children, used to be uh, places you know people would go and have all these sorts of activities and they are now completely abandoned. They are abandoned buildings. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very depressing uh, site. And uh, of course, the, you know, uh, the, the way they justify this, they, they have tried to justify this, is as, as a result of the crisis, which I, was, I explained in, you know, in, when I spoke to you in the beginning, uh, the fact is that the population of Puerto Rico has dropped dramatically. Uh, over the last decade, it's the first time. The first time since we have been conducting censuses in Puerto Rico, that population has dropped. Puerto Rico had about 3.8 billion people in million people in, uh, in 2010, 3.8 million, and the last census, uh, the figure was at like 
million. So, so, so uh, it's a huge. Level. So th there was a huge fall in the population, and of, uh, and of course they say, well, you know, since we have less people, we need less schools. Problem with that argument is that schools, as they were operating back in 1910, where many of them were very overcrowded. You know, we have 30, 40 students per 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 school, uh, you know, room or per, uh, you know per uh, classroom, and so on and so forth. So the fact that we have less people now and less children now should have been uh, the opportunity not to close the schools, but rather to uh, achieve something which many teachers have always demanded, which is let's have, now we can have smaller groups. Now we don't have to have the schools, you know, so crowded. Now we can have the schools we want to have with the space and with the, the necessary uh, uh, room size so that teachers can pay attention to the more individualized attention to the students and so on and so forth. But no, since there were less students, the solution was let's close all the schools, no matter what the consequences, and that way we can save money, and that way we can pay the bondholders, which is, you know, what's the basic idea behind all of these austerity measures. We have to pay the bondholders, so we have to cut back uh, uh, government spending, so we have to cut back education, education spending, so let's close schools. And uh, so we've had this tragedy of, uh, of as I said, uh, I think it's. I think the figure is around 25 percent of the schools that existed in Puerto Rico five or six years ago. This was done very rapidly. Uh, do not exist anymore. And as I said, this has been very disruptive. You know, students who used to go to school, which was you know a few streets from where they live, they walk to the school. Now they have to travel. You know, one hour or whatever to the new school where they have been reassigned, mm -hmm. which is in another town or another barrio. And so on. Demina, uh, the son of the uh, governor that I previously mentioned, uh, uh, Pedro Rosselló, his son, uh, Ricardo Rosselló, got elected uh, in 2016. So he came with a, a similar agenda of privatization. <laughs> and actually, he brought with him a sinister character called Julia Kelleher, who had a, a, her own uh, a nonprofit that dealt with privatization of, uh, you know, uh, schools in the United States. And uh, she previously had worked with the United States Department of Education. And actually it was more scandalous. The previous governor, Alejandro Garcia Padilla also briefly employed her as a, you know, as a consultant. So uh, this person came to Puerto Rico, you know, uh, from the United States, doesn't know, uh, you know, the system, uh, and she and the governor, you know, start implementing this agenda that, that uh, Dr. Bernabe spoke about. But, uh, but there are more grave uh, actions that happen. As for example, I got right here an entry, you know, I'm not speaking out of uh, guessing about, you know, at that time, the president of the Teachers Federation uh, was Mercedes Martinez. And unfortunately, in January uh, the 17th, uh, she met with uh, Julia Kelleher and in the meeting also was the vice president of the then Teachers Federation. And they said that, uh, you know, they could work with uh, Ms. Kelleher. You know, <laughs> well, if you are really a serious labor organization, you should have opposed that uh, person that already comes, you know, uh, advising uh, matters of privatization in the United States. So, I mean, this person was, uh, uh, you know, named and confirmed by the Puerto Rican Senate as a secretary of education. And, uh, you know, all hell broke loose during her tenure. I mean, this person uh, completely disrespected the, not only the teachers, the whole country, and she carried out this, uh, uh, you know, agenda of uh, privatization. There is, I want to, you know, uh, say a few things, uh, and we're going back to, uh, you know, Puerto Rican history, uh, because, uh, you know, the, the advance of uh, the workers' uh, benefits and uh, uh, workers' powers happen if there is a combative and militant and independent and a strong trade union movement, all right? So... Decades uh, ago, you know, uh, particularly since uh, the late 60s, 
the trade union leadership in Puerto Rico, a, a lot of it was uh, made of independent trade unions that had no relationship with the FLCIO. And there was an FLCIO group in Puerto Rico, it, you know, uh, which uh, came, it came in big numbers during Operation Bootstrap, you know, uh, they, they, they uh, came to the island and they did class collaborationist politics, but also at the same time, did coexist a sector that, uh, you know, uh, had uh, even communist uh, and socialist influence. And uh, particularly, I'm gonna refer, you know, like I said, to the late sixties, and I'm gonna speak a little bit about the seventies until the early eighties. You know, in the in the sixties, in the you know in, in the late sixties, early seventies, it, it, it was even created an organization called the Mo Movimiento Obrero Unido, which uh, was an intent of gather the trade union movement. And actually, that uh, a collaboration was led by a militant socialist, uh, a, a, you know, a trade unionist called uh, Pedro Grant at that time. And throughout the decade they were able to uh, organize the Water Resources Authority workers. Uh, you know, a lot of the leaders became the teachers uh, uh, union, the leaders, the uh, teachers federation. And all, you know, all these militants carry out brave and uh, valiant uh, fights that uh, actually gain uh, even uh, a lot of significance in the law, in the labor laws in Puerto Rico. As for example, in, in the year 1976, it was to approve uh, the law 80, which uh, prohibits uh, employers from firing uh, workers without you know, just cause. In the Puerto Rico, that was a big victory. And also it happened a lot of strikes that were victorious. As for example, in the year 1974, there was uh, the firemen were on strike, the electric car workers were on strike, the water resources were on strike. The teachers uh, were on strike. It that, was that, so much that sounds that sounds like a general strike. What what is the situation yeah. today? Because it seems let, let like me, let attacks... me finish with this, please. Let, I, I'm gonna be brief. Uh, you know, so it was like a general strike. You know, for all beings. But you know, since the '80s, and particularly since the '90s, a lot of these trade union leaders have become very reformist. Actually. You know, uh, a, a lot of these uh, trade union leaders that were Stalinists in the 70s, they became a Democratic Party uh, uh, sympathizers and officials. Uh, you know, uh, the, the case of this uh, uh, person that I mentioned, Jose Rodriguez Paez, he came out in, uh, in the year 2000 to support, you know, uh, this pro-business a Democratic Party, U.S. Democratic Party uh, uh, member, Sila Calderon. So what has happened in the labor movement? Certainly, since the 90s has been a tendency to class collaborationists, uh, you know, uh, and actually, you know, unfortunately and tragically, Dr. Bernabe knows, the FLCIO group and, uh, you know, more or less a Christian democratic organization at uh, the Central Puerto Rican de Trabajadores, Help that you know, and one of the leading bankers, uh, Richard Carrion, you know, which is the CEO and president of uh, Banco Popular, the largest bank on the island, to organize what they call a, a social uh, a, a meeting, you know, a cumbre social, where you know, supposedly workers and uh, you know, entrepreneurs could collaborate to make a, a better Puerto Rico. We have to say these things because that, you know, this points out the difference of what was back then and what it is, unfortunately, right now. Actually, I mean, uh, the, you know, we have mentioned the issue of the uh, Electrical uh, Resources Authority, which uh, Dr. Bernabe described in his earlier uh, intervention. You know, this thing has been announced actually in, in the uh, years before this took into place, a very reactionary uh, uh, senator, Eduardo Batia, you know, he, he uh, introduced a legislation to have these things uh, come to effect and it was approved. 
And uh, a year ago, it has now been revealed that personnel from Luma Energy has been already inside, you know, dealing with the electric authority resources. What was the response of the labor movement? I mean, when this privatization was announced, the president of uh, UTIER, which is the trade union that, uh, uh, one of the trade unions that handles that area, publicly, and I can, you know, prove to you through a, you know, a press conference that he made. At one point he said, well, we are looking after some sort of a deal like the telephone uh, corporation uh, uh, did when, you know, the, the telephone corporation was privatized, that we can get a good collective bargaining. My question is, was that the right appropriate uh, path to take in, to, you know, facing what they were going to face and they knew that was coming. The response should have been that, uh, you know, it should have been launched a general strike to prevent the subcontracting and the privatization of these areas. Well, Senator Bernabe, I mean, what is the response and what should the response be? I know uh, in the United States, there is a growing strike wave of workers against the attacks and privatization, outsourcing, using nonprofits is, is massive in the public sector. What should be the response and what politically you see the way going forward in the working class to build a movement to stop privatization, to bend public services and, and stop the attacks on workers? Let me say uh, first, you know, as I said before, I don't want to give the impression that, it, that this, the terrible things that have been going on in Puerto Rico in the last 10 years, let's say, the uh, policies of the board, which the austerity policies of the board, the closing of the schools, the privatization of the electric school system, the uh, the uh, reduction of the of the uh, budget of government agencies, including the University of Puerto Rico, that these things have been going on without any resistance. That is that is not the impression that people should get. Uh, we've had several strikes, for example, in the student strikes in the University of Puerto Rico in 2010. In 2011, in 2017, we have one strike right now. The University of Puerto Rico is on strike right now. The students are uh, defending the university against these uh, attacks by the government and attacks by the board after 2017. At the same time, we, we've had uh, teachers organizations, including the Teachers Federation and others as well, which, uh, who, which uh, mobilized very strongly against the, um, the closing of the schools. You know, they protested, they, they occupied some of the schools at some point, uh, they picketed, they marched, they had, you know, stoppages, you know, uh, paros as we call them, and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, they were not able to stop these things, but there was significant uh, resistance. And that um, in the same fashion, you know, they have been a, in, in 19, um, 2009, the government approved a measure which meant the uh, firing or the laying off of close to 20,000 uh, public employees. There was mobilization against that. There was a one day paro general, general stoppage, as we call it in, in Puerto Rico, uh, and so on and so forth. In, in 1914, there was another law, which is law 66, which uh, uh, basically froze collective bargaining in the government, in the government and uh, um, rescinded many improvements in wages and uh, benefits that had been already negotiated, but they were left uh, in abeyance uh, as a result of this legislation. And, and all of these things generated protests, marches, pickets, and so on. My, the main problem here, I think, has one of the problems has been the lack of unity. That is to say, this resist and we've also had a resistance by environmental groups, uh, women's groups, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. And so people are mobilizing and people are active and people are resisting in, in ma many different ways. Uh, but so far, this has been a very fragmented resistance. You have one union doing something over here. You have another union doing something over there. You have the women's groups doing something uh, in another front. You have the students doing something in another area and so on. And we we haven't had a mechanism of coordinating, of, of elaborating a sort of minimum. One of the things that we need, I think, is a minimum program. It's a, you know, it can be five or six things that we all agree on. 
We, we may disagree on many issues. We may disagree on the status of Puerto Rico. We may disagree on whether we should overthrow capitalism or not. We may, you know, there, there can be many disagreements, but we, we can agree that we are against the Luma contract, that we are against the charter schools, that we are against the budget cuts at the university, that we are against the uh, agreement that they are trying to, to uh, approve with the bondholders and so on and so forth. Some basic uh, demands that we can all agree on and that we can all mobilize behind. I think we have to work in that direction. We have to, to go beyond this uh, sort of fragmentation that we've had in the past. And uh, the, I think, you know, my, my perspective is that we have to realize that, there, that none of the organizations that exist today in Puerto Rico or the coalitions or the, and so on, are uh, monolithic. That is, you have people who are militant, who are active, who are very committed in all of them. For example, uh, uh, the CPT, Central Puerto Rican de Trabajadores, you know, there are very bureaucratic sectors within that current, but there are also people who are very active and very militant. So it's not that one can say, you know, well, we are not going to work with this federation because it's very reactionary, because there are, you know, all sorts of people with it. Within the with this within this uh, uh, organization, so that's one thing we have to uh, go beyond. I there's one event that that uh, those uh, listening to what happened, what's going on in Puerto Rico, we have to mention because it has been tremendously important, and I think it's kind of unique in our history. It's the first time this happens, and it has to do with what uh, a little bit with what uh, Ricardo was saying. Uh, this um, Secretary of Education, Julia Kelleher. Uh, was uh, indicted. She was arrested and indicted after she had uh, resigned the post of, of Secretary of Education uh, on corruption charges. And um, uh, so she was not only bad for education, she was also stealing money. And um, But the moment of her arrest, uh, the, the, her arrest was one of the things that kind of sparked, it didn't cause, but it sparked very huge mobilizations in Puerto Rico in 2019. We had 20 days, the summer of, of, the summer of two, uh, 2019 in Puerto Rico, from basically July 5 to July 22, 23, in which you had every single day thousands of people in the streets culminating in a march, which some people have called a million person march. I don't know if there were a million people, there were close to a million people uh, on the streets in Puerto Rico on that day. And uh, it forced Governor Ricard, uh, Ricardo Rosselló to resign. And for the first time in Puerto Rico's history, a governor is forced to resign, could not complete his term uh, because people in the streets mobilized and said, this guy has to, has to go. And, and of course, one of the reasons why people were so mad at, at Rosselló was one of the things was precisely the, the disaster of the closing of the schools, which uh, we, we have been mentioning. You know, this is one of the things that made people very upset. The very, very terrible way in which he handled the, uh, the Maria, Hurricane Maria emergency, the corruption of the government and so on and so forth. All of these things uh, added up to the fact that people were completely fed up and they went on the streets and the governor had to resign. So, so there's a lot of, as I said, there's a lot of fighting spirit. There's a lot of resistance spirit out in the streets, in, in the university and elsewhere. But I think where we are failing is that we are not, uh, we have not been able to harness this, this uh, willingness to fight uh, in many ways because there has been no, no effort or no successful effort to coordinate yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, joint, joint uh, uh, actions. Uh, as well, we the, did, the late, you know, I mean, the latest in, in, the, in the early 20th century, I mean, in the early 21st century, in the, you know, 2000, between 2000 and 2002, uh, we had this sort of coalition, you know, uh, in the struggle against the Navy presence in Vieques. Uh, and before that, we had something similar when we were fighting against privatization in the 1990s, when we created an uh, the labor movement created something called the CAOS, the committee of the broad committee of uh, labor, labor and organizations. organizations. Yeah. yeah, and uh, which, uh, you know, which uh, was not perfect, but it was certainly a mechanism in which many sectors of the labor movement, uh, despite their many differences, were able to come together and were able to, and we had the 
the 30-day uh, long uh, strike of the telephone workers against the privatization of the system. We had a two-day uh, general strike and so on and so forth. And unfortunately, chaos dissolved soon after the defeat of, of that struggle. But I think we have to, you know, struggle to create, work to create some sort of uh, coordinating mechanism in which all of these dispersed resistances can come together and uh, we can, you know, uh, build on, on that basis. The, uh, corruption in Luma now with the, uh, the CEO there refusing yeah. to provide the figures. I mean, uh, basically saying to hell with the rules, transparency, I'm not going to release the information. Is there a movement to throw him out and to, to renationalize, yeah. take over that? Uh, well, yeah, well, yeah, no, the case of Luma is, is, uh, is really scandalous, as you say. Of course, there was a movement against the, uh, the Luma contract from, from, from the moment that it was made public. Uh, and a Luma, this private corporation, actually took over the management of the system on June 1st of this year, June 1st. And uh, as I said, the experience since, since June to, to, to this moment, to November, has been terrible. And most people would agree you know, that it has been terrible. People are very discontent with, with the uh, performance of uh, Luma. But one of, the, one of the consequences of privatization, which is cost doesn't surprise us, but uh, it has been a learning experience to many people that have illusions about privatization, is that things that were in the past uh, in the public domain, I mean, as I said, as I, uh, now that I am a senator, I, have, I get to participate in hearings in the legislature and so on. And at some point, I, the, the, uh, the uh, director of the public, uh, what remains of the public electrical system was there uh, testifying. And I asked him, I asked him, you know, how much, if I ask you, how much do you earn? Like, what's your salary? You, you tell me, right? I said, yeah, of course, I have to tell you. It's a private, it's a, it's a public uh, utility, you know, and, and my salary is a public uh, information. You know, everybody knows what I earn, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, but, uh, but the problem is, you know, when you ask uh, the, the CEO of Luma, you know, how much do you earn? What's your salary? Then he said, no, I'm not going to tell you. It's a secret, you know. And in the same, in the same fashion, if, if I, I told the director of the, uh, of the electrical company, the public electrical company, if I ask you how many linemen you have right now employed, you know, in the, in the system, in the public, in, your, in, in the corporation, the public corporation that you would tell me said, yeah i would tell you, you know it's two thousand or three thousand or whatever the number is but then if you ask this guy stensby is his name uh what's what's um you know how many linemen does luma have uh then he said no i'm not going to tell you so everything is a secret luma is operating a a public utility and it's operating it with public money but everything is a secret this has been make made many people very indignant we we, we don't know how much he earns. We don't know how many linemen they have. We don't know uh, how many employees they have and so on and so forth. So the legislature had to go to the courts. They had to go to a judge so that the judge would order this guy to reveal this information. And once the judge ordered, ordered that, uh, he still resisted. He still would not uh, provide the information uh, the judge even had to issue an arrest warrant against this guy. Uh, you know, the, the head of the privatizing company, uh, you know, uh, he had to issue an arrest warrant so that they would bring him to the court so that he provide the information. And under that threat, he eventually, you know, finally provided the information that the legislature was seeking. And, uh, and uh, you know, people have been very outraged because one of the things that, that we discover when we, when we get to look at the information is that he has a salary of about a million dollars a year you know a million dollars a year this guy gets uh, for operating the system for directing the operation of the system and for example it, it turns out that they have about 300 linemen uh, you know which this is the people who go out you know get on the lampposts and so on to fix the system and maintain the system when there's an outage you know they go out and fix it and so on they have about, about 300 and um, even they claim that 
uh, they can they they would operate the system and they, they could operate the system with 800 so they are 500 short and and the and the um, the public corporation used to operate with much more than that so so it's no wonder that this system is falling apart because they don't even have uh, the people required to maintain the system uh, operating uh, you know uh, adequately so uh, so yes, the, the, the situation right now is that Luma is operating the system. The system is doing very badly. The government and the governor are still uh, very um, stubbornly sticking with the contract, saying that the contract cannot be rescinded, that it cannot be suspended, that Luma is going to work better, that they are just beginning and so on and so forth. They are they're refusing to reconsider the contract and, but the pressure and the discontent of the people is growing. So, so it's, it's, a, it's a growing conflict because uh, perhaps in the beginning, as sometimes happens, many people had the illusion that privatization was going to fix the problem of the electrical system in Puerto Rico. But by now, many people who thought that, you know, are having second thoughts about that, uh, that, about that notion. And uh, so, so that's where we, we are, we are right now. The, the big news in the last few days, as I said, has been the revelation of this information, which uh, regarding the salaries that these people have, regarding the, uh, the lack of employees that, that, uh, that the company still and, has. And, and then you're having control. blackouts. You can't even keep on your regular electricity. Oh, no, absolutely. So, so no, it's, on top of that, you know, they're, they're taking money and they can't even keep the electricity. No, no, it, the problem is that what this is happening, it would be a big chance and opportunity to mobilize the Puerto Rican masses because as, you know, we are discussing, oh, even the petty bourgeoisie, the capitalist class of Puerto Rico, is, you know, they're not satisfied with Luma. I mean, uh, so this is a big opportunity to organize and rally massively against uh, Luma. I want to say a couple of things uh, before we leave, because we are running out of time, as you can tell. Uh, it is uh, certain, you know, what uh, prof uh, you know, Dr. Bernabe has mentioned. All these, uh, you, know, uh, def you know, there has been a lot of defeats in the last 10 years, and uh, without a doubt, that has been the case. And uh, certainly there has been a, a lot of mobilizations, but unfortunately, there is a couple of things that are lacking in Puerto Rico. Number one is uh, a revolutionary party or you know, an independent workers party. And certainly, you know, uh, what has intensified in Puerto Rico in the last uh, 20 years is uh, what uh, Leon Trotsky called a, a role as a, played as a middle caste by uh, some of the labor organizations vis-a-vis -vis the FLCIO that have uh, deterred, you know, uh, the advancement so far, uh, you know, uh, the workers in Puerto Rico. Uh, as for example, uh, Dr. Bernabe mentions all these strikes and actually I, I will add, it was the victory, the mobilization of the people of Puerto Rico to stop the gas pipe, uh, natural gas uh, uh, transport plants. It was a big victory, but certainly the balance has been unfortunate. And there has been a lot of one day general strikes, a lot of uh, two days uh, strikes, a week strikes, whatever. But, you know, they have not brought a unified labor movement. So, you know, what we need, what they need in Puerto Rico at this time is, uh, you know, uh, like a, a Leon Trotsky said in the transitional program, a, a, a fight against uh, the role of the treasurer's. Uh, a trade union bureaucracy, the establishment of a, a labor, independent labor party and independence of, a, you know, a class a conscious organizations. Well, Senator Bernabe, there is a movement uh, of trade unions. I mean, there were teachers who opposed in the United States, there were teachers who opposed the privatization in Puerto Rico of education. They came down there. I went down there. Many other teachers came down. There is also an effort now in some unions, the San Francisco Labor Council and others, to get uh, support for renationalization of REPA. And apparently the IBW, uh, a U.S. Electrical Workers Union, is opposing that. What would you say to American workers about solidarity, about helping to build support for the 
uh, Puerto Rican working class to defend its conditions and its, its ability to survive because uh, these uh, blackouts of destruction, environmental destruction, the hurricanes, uh, the power failures, this climate change is, is radically affecting not just Puerto Rico, but all parts of the world and, and the Caribbean particularly. Well, I think that the, well, th several things. One of them is the, the, the objective is even less uh, daunting than renationalizing re because it hasn't been privatized in the sense that they have not, they did not turn over the, the distribution and trans, uh, transmission system uh, over to Luma. Luma doesn't own it. It's still owned by the public, which is a good thing. What they have done is they have contract, it's a contract with Luma that Luma, as a private enterprise, manages the system, which is still publicly owned, at least in paper. So it's not even that we, are that we have to take back something that, that was given to Luma. We just have to rescind this, this contract, you know, suspend this contract. There are some penalties that you, you would have to pay, but you could go to court and demonstrate that, you know, these penalties should not be paid and so on and so forth. But it's not even, it's not even that difficult. You know, it's, it's a contract that was signed and it's a contract that can be... Um, um, terminated. Uh, terminated, exactly. You know, uh, and you could make a very good argument that Luma has not been able to fulfill its part of the contract and therefore there's good uh, legal reason for terminating the contract and so on. I think that my message to, um, you know, regarding U.S. unions in Puerto Rico, I have a perspective which is, you know, th there can be many different views about this. And I would say two things about this. One of them is that I am not one of those, there are those who would say that intervention and the presence of U.S. unions, AFL-CIO unions, or change to win unions, or the Teamsters, or whatever, in Puerto Rico has always been negative, has always been uh, an obstacle to the development of the labor movement. I personally do not agree with that perspective. Uh, I think that American unionism in Puerto Rico has had uh, some very negative impacts in many cases, but not always, not always. And the actions of U.S. trade unions in Puerto Rico have not always been uh, had a negative uh, uh, impact. To give you an example, the mole that uh, Ricardo mentioned before, which is a very significant uh, labor organization in the 1970s, the great work included AFL-CIO unions. There were AFL-CIO unions within the mole. So, so it's not, you know, like AFL-CIO bad or U.S. unions bad and Puerto Rican unions good. It's, it's, it, it's for well, me. But the question is, why should U.S. unions be organizing yeah. in Puerto Rico? Oh. Okay. When, when the majority of workers in the United States are unorganized. No, 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 no. I'm, going, I'm going to that, but, 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 but still, but still, you know, but, it, but that's another question. But, but I do, I mean, and if we have to have a debate about this, we'll have it in another program, but I do. <laughs> we also, need to have a debate about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and also, I think we have to stop idealizing Puerto Rican unions. Puerto Rican unions, so-called Puerto Rican unions, can be as bureaucratic, as reformist, and as detrimental to the Puerto Rico yeah, working class. I, actually, I, I made sure. No, no, I, let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. Now, my, my argument is that, as you said, people in the United States need to understand that Puerto Rico is, how should I put it? It's a different place. It has a different political tradition. It has a different culture. It has a different context. It has a different problems that are different from those you have in the United States. And that therefore the most, I think, appropriate way for American unions to relate to Puerto Rico is to be in contact with Puerto Rican unions, be in contact with Puerto Rican working class organizations and in coordination with them, determine which is, what is it that the American unions can do to help the labor movement in Puerto Rico. Instead of simply uh, organizing something or intervening in some way or another, try to find out what's going on in Puerto Rico and, uh, and uh, you know, and, and see how we can coordinate, you know, better for the benefit of the Puerto Rican labor movement. Well, the, the experience of privatization in the United States and in Puerto Rico are useful for both workers of both countries to understand the lessons mm -hmm. of this fight against privatization. Uh, it's not unique to uh, Puerto Rico or to the United States. It's going on internationally uh, with capitalism, trying to destroy mm -hmm. public resources around the world. Uh, 
So I, sure. I yeah, I, I just want to say a couple of things uh, right, very quick. Number one is uh, the labor bureaucracy, whether it's a Puerto Rican union or it's an American union, is a uh, role, you know, if he supports the capitalist system and doesn't oppose the capitalist system, it will play a role of the middle okay. caste. And uh, it's true that there were a couple of exceptions in, you know, in the uh, FLCIO unions in Puerto Rico. But at that time, those chapters in Puerto Rico were led by socialists, like in the Teamsters, as you okay. said. You know, Rene Rodriguez was oh, a socialist. Yeah, okay. well, let, let, let me finish, like you said. Ah. But, but you know, the, you know, as a whole, the role of the FLCIO as an organization is supporting the foreign policy of the United States. And that's what they send money through the National Endowment to Democracy to oppose us, for example, the Venezuelan government. Okay. And now they are also mm -hmm. intervening in uh, uh, giving funds to Cuba. They did in the past uh, funds for uh, solidarity, which uh, was channeled to the CIA, you know, Central Intelligence Agency to overthrow the deformed worker state in Poland. So, and in Puerto Rico in the 50s, okay, you know, the FLCIO we're gonna have to... as a group uh, was, you know, supporting the colonial system. Okay. So we're, it's not we're... a fact of uh, Puerto Rican versus American. It's the trade union aristocracy or bureaucracy. Okay. Well, I want to thank both of you for joining us. Uh, we've had a lively discussion and we do need more solidarity between the U.S. and Puerto Rican workers to learn about the experiences, struggles, and how to defend workers in Puerto Rico and the United States. So thanks for joining us on Workweek.